All right, hi everybody. I want you to be able to follow along with today's Bible sections. This one from the Mark Gospel is first on the list and it kind of sets the tone for the other Bible sections because you'll see from the picture and the words that Jesus is talking about the way his word works. Now, the reason there's seeds and plants growing out of them is because he's saying in the same way a seed, when you stick it in the ground, it actually is dead and it decomposes. And out of a decomposed seed comes something that's alive. That's weird. And he says God's word works the same way. It's words that either people speak into the air or someone else can hear them or they're words that are in print and somebody reads them. Then the Bible saying, Jesus here himself is telling us, it's a weird way the way it works. He's saying, but God's word does work. And when it says works, it means it gets in people's heads and makes them depend on what the God's word stuff says, which is Jesus and what he did in people's place. So that's what you'll see, no matter what Bible section we're looking at today, this first one or the second one from the Old Testament or this third one from the book of Colossians. I think we're ready to go. So when it talks at the beginning of this Bible section about God's kingdom or the kingdom of God, sometimes Jesus calls it the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't mean this is what it's like in heaven. He means this is what it's like on planet earth now when God brings people into his family of believers. He says that doesn't happen that doesn't happen in a normal way. He uses his word, the Bible, it's news about the bad news about our sin and the good news about what Jesus did in our place to get into our heads and make us believe stuff we would normally just dismiss. So that's what he's talking about at the beginning when he says God's kingdom, God's family of believers here is like what happens when a farmer scatters seeds in a field. Days go by. The farmer sleeps at night and gets up each day. In other words, he's not doing a thing to make the seeds grow. Those seeds sprout and grow, but the farmer doesn't know how. The soil, without the farmer's help, makes seeds sprout and grow into plants. First, you see the green stem, then a bud, then the ripe grain. When the crop is ready, the farmer takes a sickle to it. It's harvest time. Now, what he means here when he says, first you see the stem, and then you see the bud, and then there's ripe grain. What he means is that when God's word works, you can see that it's work working because people who he worked inside of their heads will show it in the way they talk, what they talk about, and the people that they rub up against, you know, Christians who know about what Jesus did in their place want to inconvenience themselves to help other people, even they might be strangers or enemies, it's going to show. So that's what it means when it says, first you see the green stem, there's not much to see at first, then the bud, and then the ripe grain. In other words, so believers grow up as they keep using God's word, then they grow in what we might call Christian virtues, Stuff you can see, but their Christian virtues are not what determine where they stand with God. Where they stand with God is something Jesus determined. Look at the next paragraph, verse 30. Jesus asked, how can we picture God's kingdom? What's it like? 
It's like a mustard seed, one of the smallest seeds. Someone plants it. When it comes up, it grows taller than all the garden plants. Its branches are so large that birds can nest in its shade. Now, Jesus talked a lot about the way God's word works, and he used a lot of different stories, like his story about the farmer throwing seeds out into his plowed field, and then the four different results that happened. That's what you got on the screen here. Remember, the first result was that, that birds just gobbled up the seeds that were in the field and other times people stepped on them. And that's like people who hear the message, but they don't get it. It doesn't register nothing. Then the, the second time, the second result is that a seed might take root, but then when you get a drought, then everything's gone. And that is like what happens with God's word when people hear it and believe it at first, but then their problems and pressures in life just eradicate it. And then the person's back to being as much a non-depender on Jesus as they were before. And then the third result is the one about the thorns coming up and choking the seeds. And then Jesus explained that's what happens when people let their life and their worries, their jobs, etc., get in the way and then they disconnect from God's word and their savior. And they're just, they're back to being a non-believer again. And then the fourth result was this one where the, the seed actually grows into a mature plant. I don't know if what Jesus is saying is that 75% of the time God's word doesn't work on people. All we do know that he is saying is that it does work on people I don't know what percentage of the time it does or doesn't. But you can see that, you know, Jesus is using comparisons from everyday life to help make his point. And that's what it talks about in the last paragraph, verse 33. It says, Jesus used a lot of stories like these to teach people God's message. Then people could understand his point. He always used stories to teach him. But when he was alone with the people he trained, he would explain the whole thing to them. So this is kind of a summary of Jesus' tactic, his strategy, how, how he tried to communicate with people. And we see that Jesus isn't just some fumbling, bumbling oaf like you and me. He's actually God. And it's important for us to understand he doesn't make everybody that hears believe. And that he, Jesus, uses God's word to do the work. It's got supernatural power in it. And so in that way, he's just like us. All we can do is tell other people the bad news about our condition as humans, the good news about God's remedy or antidote that that Jesus provided with his life and his damnation, death on the cross in our place. Does that make sense? So I want you to understand what it's talking about. It's saying God's word does work on people. And then that leads us to the second Bible reading. We always like to take something from the Old Testament Bible. And so here's Ezekiel a Bible book we don't get into too much. And look, it's just a snippet. It's just a paragraph. But even though it was written hundreds of years before Jesus started teaching people God's truths, it's the same message. So the same things that God taught in the New Testament Bible are in the Old Testament Bible, too, the exact same teachings. So there's never been a disconnect between God's strategy to reach people or, or what's the solution he has to offer people. There's not an Old Testament solution and a New Testament solution. It's always been the same solution, what Jesus came to do as a human being while retaining all his godness. 
Here we go. Verse 22. This is what the ruler, Yahweh, says. Remember, it only uses this name, Yahweh, for God when it's trying to remind us or clue us in on his, his plan to rescue all people by having Jesus be their representative, the representative of every single human being in history. And look what he says. I'm going to personally grab the top of a tall cedar tree. I'm going to break off its highest shoot and plant it on Israel's tallest mountain. It's going to grow branches and reproduce. It's going to. It's going to become magnificent. Every kind of bird is going to nest in it. Its branches are going to shelter all kinds of birds. In other words, it's saying God's word works even in places and on people you wouldn't expect it to work. He's saying, wow, I mean, these birds that come to shelter in this. I mean, if you want to picture this, this uh, shoot and th that becomes this uh, magnificent tree being God's word, then that will work. Or if you want to picture it being Jesus, then he's the shelter or only safe place anybody can go to be sure where they stand from God. Then they got to use God's word to understand it. So whichever way you want to understand, but you see that it's saying the same thing. God's word works. It works on people, even ones you wouldn't expect. Verse 24, then all the trees in the land will recognize that I am Yahweh. I'm the one that makes imposing trees unimportant. And I make unimportant trees imposing. I'm the one that makes green trees dead. And I make dead trees come to life. I, Yahweh, give you people my word and I'm going to do it. He's going to make sure that his word works, that his message, the bad news, nobody wants to hear the truth about our human condition, and the good news about how he did an unusual remedy that no human being ever could have imagined on their own. So this is also really good news because he's reminding us there's no way that people on their own can fix their problems with God. He's got to do all the heavy lifting or nothing's going to happen. He's the one that gives us the message and he's the one that brings us into his family of believers. This makes sense. So there's, you know, you see that the old Testament Bible's in complete sync with the New Testament Bible books and their message. And if that doesn't convince you, we got the Colossians letter. So we're in Colossians 1. Uh, the reason we don't have Colossians verses 1 and 2 in this section is because it's telling us who the letter is to, but we know who the letter is to because it says Colossians. These are people who live in the Turkish city of Colossae. That's, like I said, in Turkey. And it's not a big, fancy, famous metropolitan area. It's kind of a run-of-the-mill population center. And, um, and God made sure the message got to this hole-in-the-wall place. Because there were people there that he had decided to reach with his message. And the first verse, one and two, tells us who the message was for. And then it tells us who God used to send the message. It's the missionary Paul. He is in Europe at the time. He's in Rome, Italy, under house arrest. That doesn't stop God's word from working. It's going to be productive, or like this screen says, fruitful. It's going, that's a fancy way of saying it works. 
So take a look at this section. This is the one we'll spend a little time today talking about, and hopefully it'll make more sense. In fact, we'll be able to understand all three of the Bible readings better once we take a little more deliberate look at this Colossians section. So take a look with me. Now we can follow along in your in print Bible if you want. That will have maps in the back where you can actually look for the city of Colossae. You might also want to look for the city of Ephesus, which is not far away from it. It's to the west. And you will take a look at where those cities are compared to Rome, Italy. That will also be, if you got a Bible that has the maps on it, yeah, otherwise you can use the internet or whatever you want. If you're using your hard copy Bible, then you can make notes in it. If you're using your electronic version, your own favorite translation, then you can kind of compare it as I read with what you're hearing from me. So here we go. Every time we pray for you people, we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Messiah. We thank him for the trust we've heard you all have in Messiah Jesus and the love you show all God's people. You have this trust and love because you're sure of what God has promised you in heaven. You learned about all this back when you first heard the truth, God's good news, which is the real truth. That's kind of hinting at the fact that these people he's writing to have heard some stuff that isn't really the truth. And that's the reason why the missionary Paul wrote this letter and God used it, incorporated it into our Bible, is because it's God's truth and it does a great job of combating stuff that's part true and part misleading. We're in verse uh, six. This good news is spreading all over the world with great success. In other words, God's word works. It works everywhere under any conditions. This happened in your group too. Ever since you first heard about God's amazing kindness, that's when you guys came to learn about how we all deserve the exact opposite of what he gives. You learned this from our good friend and coworker, Epaphras. He's taking your place here in Rome. You can depend on the news that he spreads from Messiah. He's the one, this Epaphras guy is the one who told us about the love you people show from the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit. God's the one that makes people care once they heard how Jesus rescued them, then they, they say, this just isn't about me. God wants to get this news out to other people. And so they care enough to share the message with other people because they don't want them doomed and damned. And so they share it before it's too late. So that's this Colossians section. And here's a, a, the point for today. Is that God's word the only seed? And you can see it talks about it that way. God's word as a seed in the first Bible reading we had for today. And it talks about it as a little tiny plant in the second Bible reading. And the point is that God's word is the only seed you can plant anywhere in the world and it will grow. And like we said before, it doesn't matter even the conditions. God can make his word work no matter who we're talking about. And, you know, it could be the worst enemy in the world of God's truth. He's telling us it'll work. I mean, Paul used to be a perfect example of that. He used to be a dyed in the wool Jesus hater. I mean, he was hunting, he's a Jewish rabbi, and he quit being a Jewish rabbi so that he could hunt down Christians in another country 
up in Syria. And Jesus made a personal appearance and his word worked on this confirmed Jesus hater. It is unbelievable. Now here, we didn't have to look at a map. I think maps help us because then we can see what's going on here. This country you can see is in blue. It's Southwest Turkey. This is the country of Turkey. And there's Colossi right in the middle there in this green color. And then if you go straight to the West, you'll see Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is where Paul was originally when a guy from Colossae traveled a hundred miles just to get to Ephesus. He probably had to do some major shopping or something. He had some reason for coming from Colossae all the way over to Ephesus because it was the big population center, the massive population center in this southwest part of Turkey. The guy who came from Colossae to Ephesus is this guy it talks about in verse seven. Verse seven, it mentions you people in Colossae learned this news from Epaphras. So this Epaphras guy is someone that got to know Paul in Ephesus. And then the stuff that Paul taught him from Jesus, that Jesus taught him is what Epaphras brought when he came back home a hundred miles away to Colossae, 100 miles. You don't just get home a hundred miles in Bible times in an hour or two, like we can today. It's going to take five days of being on the road, walking for 20 miles a day, and then camping on the side of the road or anywhere where you can get, right? This is a weird word, Epaphras. In fact, maybe you've never even heard this word before. But this is the name of the guy that God used to bring the message to these people in this city of Colossae. Um, we can barely even say Colossae. We don't even know anything about Colossae. If we wouldn't have saw it on the map just now, we'd have no clue where in the world it is. But we're talking not about the Holy Land anymore. We're not talking about any of the nations that who have borders next to the Holy Land. We're not talking about Syria, Lebanon, Egypt. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about stuff that's over in the southeast part of the country of Turkey. How in the world did the message get to Colossae in Turkey? It's from this Epaphras guy. This Epaphras guy wasn't a believer at first, but he bumped into the missionary Paul, and Paul got right to it, sharing the news with this Epaphras guy, who became the leading tip of the spear to get the message. He was the first contact of a Colossi person. When he came home to Colossi, he couldn't wait to share. And he, who'd he share it with? Well, you can bet that he shared it with any friends or relatives that, you know, he spent time with. He would tell them, when I went to Ephesus, you know, I went there to buy a pool or whatever he went to buy there. And then when he came back, he had something to share with people that was way more valuable with whatever than whatever business he had had in Ephesus. So this was weird the way the people in Colossae, Turkey, first came into contact with the news about Jesus. They had to go west to get it instead of east to the Holy Land. That is really strange. I mean, here it is. This is what it looks like if you go to Ephesus, to Colossae today. See the letter to the Colossians? And the person's got their book open right at the overlook of the city of Colossae. And look at that, there's not a thing there. I mean, nothing really exists. There aren't even any spectacular looking ruins where Ephesus used to be. So the people who first heard this message were people back in Paul's time. And this guy, this Epaphras, whoever he is or whatever he did, 
he brought the message back to these people. And the more he shared it, the more it worked on people. And this was really an amazing thing. God's word was working. And the people in Colossae shared it with neighboring townspeople too. And so there were towns that were much closer than Ephesus was, where people heard the message and shared it. And so God's word was working like crazy. Even people who were slaves got the message in the city of Colossae. There was a guy, I mean, the Colossians book isn't the only book written to people in Colossae. We have two Bible books in the Bible written to people in Colossae, not just Colossians, like you can see here, but also the Philemon book is written to a guy in Colossae. So even though there's not much of this city around today, you can see it was a big deal to God, and he wanted people to hear about the message, and it worked. Even a slave owner and one of his slaves became part of God's family of believers in that town. So this is a big deal. This is, this is what the city of Ephesus looks like today. I mean, you can see they have a major uh, arena there, a, a huge outdoor theater that holds thousands and thousands of people. When Paul lived there in Ephesus, this is, I mean, only it, it was all functional. Today, it's one of the most spectacular ghost towns in the world. But though God's word radiated through the missionary Paul from this city of Ephesus to all kinds of neighboring area churches, right? So there's Ephesus on the west coast of Turkey. And this guy who lived 100 miles away benefited from it, and, and he didn't keep quiet about it when he got back home to Colossae. He shared it with all kinds of people, and so the Philemon book, the slave owner guy became a Christian, and, and all kinds of other people became Christians too. And it shared, like we said, with that city right north of Colossae, Laodicea. So there's all kinds of people who came into contact with it. We would never have been able to understand how people in Colossae or Laodicea would get the message. But God's the one behind all this. He's the one that made it happen. He used his word to work and reach out to people in these other cities. Look at this Ephesus. It was spectacular. I mean, really spectacular. And people still travel from all over the world to go to Ephesus. And then Maybe that's the reason God let all these spectacular ruins of this ginormous ghost town be around today so that it forces people to get their copy of their Bible out and look. The letter to the Ephesians, that's pretty close in our Bibles to the letter to the Colossians, uh, they were both written the same day. They were both written by the same person, the same postman, a guy named Tychicus, in the days before there was a postal service, a guy traveled all the way from Rome, Italy, to come to Ephesus with the Ephesus letter or the Ephesians letter to reach people who's got, who God worked on there. And then the same guy went 100 miles out of his way east to Colossae and delivered two Bible books there, two letters, the letter to the Colossians that we're looking at today, and this letter to Philemon, which is one chapter book. If you, if you got uh, some time here while I'm talking and you're kind of bored stiff of what I'm saying, you can look at your, in your Bible at the Philemon book and you'll see these people are in Colossae too. And so God's word was working. It reached people, brought them into God's family of believers, and made them reach out to other people and show God's kind of love to people who didn't deserve it. And, and so the Christian group there got, you know, ignited, got excited, passed the message on to other people. And then comes really a weird thing. Paul wrote these letters, like 
Colossians and Philemon from the city of Rome. He wasn't in Ephesus when he wrote this letter. That's why he wrote the Ephesians letter and two letters to Colossae, Colossians and Philemon. So three Bible books while he was in under house arrest in Rome, Italy. You can read all about this at the end of the book of Acts. But it's weird how even when the missionary, the apostle Paul, was under house arrest, God's word was still working. He writes these Bible book letters that we're looking at today, and it's helpful to all kinds of people. Now, this, you can see from the scale down to the bottom, from Colossae to Rome is like a thousand miles. And God's, and, and this is in the days before the mass transit we're used to, before cars and engines and stuff like that. And, and people are traveling under extreme conditions, extreme distances, because this word worked on them and they wanted to share it with other people. So this is really strange the way God's word works, but you know why it works? It's because you and I aren't in charge of it. God's in charge of making it happen. He uses human beings like me and you to get the message out to other people before it's too late, before our time here is up, before other people's time is up, before this world ends, right? He wants to get the message out. And remember what we talked about last week? This is really important. That failure in life is being successful at things that don't matter in the end. The stuff that does matter in the end is our connection to the news about Jesus and what he did to rescue people, all people. And all we do is pass along the news that this applies to everyone we know, see, or have in our contact lists. So everything else, you know, being successful, you know, at work, being successful financially wise, being successful health wise, None of that stuff is really successful because if you die without the news about Jesus, you are a failure. And that's what you will say forever and ever and ever and ever. So failure really is being successful at things that don't matter in the end. And God's the only one who can pull us out of failure and make us a success by bringing us into his family of believers in what Jesus did in our place. Look what the Bible says. If we say that we love God and we don't do loving things for each other, then we're being liars. It goes on to explain. If we don't do loving things for people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? In other words, the Bible's explaining the weird stuff God's word does when it works. It's making us show God's great love to people by the way we pitch in, help out people that we normally wouldn't care two hoots about. It's because we want the message about what Jesus did in our place to come out in the long run. And that's why the Bible tells us, if I don't have any urge to help out people I know or don't know, that's probably because there's something wrong with my connection to the message about Jesus. We do not want to disconnect on that. The more we use God's word, the more it's going to work on us. And there's going to be Christian living that happens automatically, spontaneously, that we cannot control because God's going to be the one controlling us. So what we always remember and what God teaches in this Colossians letter, in the Philemon letter, that's also to people in Colossae, to the people in Ephesus that went out, that those letters went out all at the same time, is that it's not about religion. It's not about what people do for God that repairs their connection to him. That's not what any part of the Bible's about. 
Not one single Bible book is about what God tells us we got to do to get in good with him. Because it won't work. We're not capable of it. We're not up to the task because of our sin instincts and urges. It's all about Jesus. All of it's about Jesus because he's the only one that had the capacity to remedy things between sinners, died in the will sinners, and their creator and judge. And he did it by being the substitute in our place. Here. On this slide, you see the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sentences the Bible tells us Jesus said while he was on the cross. He calls them seven good words. Now remember, at the time that Jesus was on the cross, the reason this frame is all dark is because people couldn't see anything. Because the Bible says between noon and three, noon and three on Good Friday, the sun went out. God turned the sun's light out because he wanted people to pay attention to these things Jesus was saying because they were of life-giving importance. It really worked, didn't, didn't it? Up on the top, the top right one, today you will be with me in paradise, is one of the sentences Jesus said in the pitch dark. You couldn't even see the back of your hand for three hours because there was no sunlight and the moon couldn't reflect any of the sun's light when the sun was out so when he said those words it was to another dying guy on the cross next to him and it worked a guy who's being killed for being a menace to society god's word worked on it. only here it was god saying his word to a guy who was watching Jesus' life. How is Jesus reacting while he's on the cross being tortured by people and suffering God's damnation? That's what the second sentence on the right reminds us about, that Jesus is suffering God's damnation sentence for every one of our sins. This word that Jesus spoke worked because you saw not only God's love in Jesus, but you see God's words that he spoke that teach us all kinds of things we would never have known on our own. That not only did people need God's forgiveness if they were going to get out of trouble, but Jesus was manufacturing that forgiveness with his life and our place in his damnation death too. We, okay, let's do it this way. Which of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sentences is the most important one? You might think, well, you mentioned that one on the, on the top right, and you mentioned the second one on the right, which is, a, which is the most important one. I would submit it's the one on the bottom left where it says it is finished. I don't know if you remember us talking about this in the past and saying that literally means I paid in full your debt to God. Everything God expects of you, I did that with my whole life. And especially with these last six hours when I'm suffering God's damnation and I'm still being kind and considerate to other people and I'm devoting myself to God's rescue plan for every sinner. He paid our sins in full. That's what it is finished mean when he suffered the damnation for every person's sin. I think that's maybe the most critical statement. I mean, here's Jesus saying this applies to everybody. And the rest of the Bible stands behind that too, right? When it says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That was John the baptizer talking. And he was saying the same things too before Jesus ever spent a second on the cross. This is the message of God's word that works on people. You see how serious sin is when God's damning the life out of his substitute for humans. He's damning the life out of God, God the Son. You see how sin, serious sin is? And you see the lengths God's willing to go to to repeal the sentence we deserve by having Jesus take our place and suffer our sentence. So the good news about Jesus reminds us, you know, in everyday life, that things don't have to be all right to be all right. 
was it all right for Jesus when he said those words we saw in the last uh, slide? No, things were not all right, but they were all right because he was eradicating any bad sentence from God, even a dirty look from him in this life or the next, right? And so that means that even though things don't look all right in my life, in your life, or in the afterlife for any of us, they are all right because Jesus gave his word and his word is going to work on us. It's going to, even though it doesn't seem like it can be correct, that things are all right, even when they're not all right. It's actually true. And we got to remind ourselves of that. That's one of the reasons we get together like this to talk this stuff over. So the Bible tells us in 1 John that our love for each other proves we have gone from death to life. Right? It might look like our bodies are wearing out. It might look like disease is going to get the best of us. But the Bible tells us, no, whoever depends on the news about Jesus, even though their body dies, it's still alive. You are still alive. And God's going to give life back to your body one day. And then you're going to be a real human being or a real body and soul for all eternity. And there's not going to be a downside to any of that. When God's word works and helps us believe this stuff is true, automatic comes a gratitude for God that we cannot stop. That's going to show in the way we deal with other people and the stuff we say, do, and, and so on. So Christian love in action is something only God can produce inside of people, inside of sinners who are dead set against doing what God wants, and especially for the right reason. And God does that when his word works on us and brings us into his family of believers. So that is a big deal. Something to remember, we'll close out our time together here by reminding our, each other that there's close to 8 billion people on earth and that maybe, maybe, 11% say they depend on Jesus to rescue. I mean, when they say that doesn't mean it's really true. And so there is a lot of work to do, right? About 40% of Earth's people have heard the news about what Jesus did for them. So what about the other 60%? Individually, we're not going to be able to put much of a dent in that. But when we pool our resources, our energy, our uh, capabilities that God gives us, the specialties that we're good at, that God gave us, our, our resources, then we're going to be able to reach out to other people along with other Christians. That's the reason why we're here. And God's word works. It works on us to care about this, and it works on other people when we get the message out to other people. So we always think this way. We're going to act locally. We're going to do things to people who know what Jesus did for us. We're going we're gonna to do the Christian living thing so that people find out, get a hint about what Jesus did. But we're always going to be thinking globally. Because there's other people outside my small circle of friends and family, right? So this is really important encouragement that we get, not just from this Colossians letter, but from the other ones too. Jesus is the one who said it. This is how people are going to recognize you're my students, when they see the loving things you do for each other. And so we're more than happy to oblige because he did a lot more than just do loving things for us, right? Well, let's close with a prayer. Father, we're grateful for the gift of Jesus. He's the one that put more than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John into our Bibles. He put these letters in the Bible for us too, because they contain more details about how Jesus got us out of trouble and how we can show our gratitude to you for these tremendous gifts. Help us not forget there's other people that could be grateful to us forever for sharing the news, for 
living the Christian life that's going to draw attention to the special thing we have to offer other people. We thank you for the beautiful gift of the Lord's Supper that you use to reach out to us personally and tell us, I label Jesus' life with your name on it. And you're a, the beneficiary of what he did in our place. So we're grateful for that as well. Help us show our gratitude in Jesus' name. And now receive and believe the blessing of the Lord himself to you that Jesus earned with his life on earth in our place and his damnation death on the cross. The Lord is blessing you all the time, even when it doesn't seem that way. And he's protecting you all the time too. The Lord's making his face smile on you constantly. And he's being gracious to you, the opposite of what all of us deserve. The Lord's looking on you with his favor. He's paying attention to every detail, even if it doesn't seem very significant in your life. And he's giving you his Bible peace, his message about Jesus peace. And so that is our time together for this week. The only other thing you got to remember is starting next week, the schedule changes. We will not um, have the service like this at this time. Uh, this service started at 10. Next week, this online service is going to start at 8. If you want to benefit from this online service and you want to be in person on Zoom at that time, it's at 8 in the morning. It'll be archived, so it'll be available for you any other time you want, just like normal. But then we're going to in-person Bible study at 9 at church in the fellowship hall, and then uh, 10 o'clock, uh, 1030, I'm sorry, is going to be the in-person service, the only in-person service we're not having 1131 anymore. That's the changes. I don't know if anyone has any questions.